Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for the uh, for David and uh, all for the invitation to present at uh, SVP. I'm sad that I was not able to attend the in-person conference last week, but I'm excited to be able to participate in this virtual space for a bit. Uh, today, I will be uh, introducing work that is part of the Advanced Geo Partnership in which we dig deeper and develop and explore collaborative efforts to promote equity in field-based sciences. Uh, in keeping with the ethos of the Advanced Geo Partnership, uh, today's talk is also a collaboratively delivered talk. Um, and so my name is Jessica Blois, and I'm a professor at the University of California, Merced. Um, we are presenting work that represents the efforts of a large team of folks uh, led by Dr. Erica Marinskiota at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the talk today is really spearheaded uh, by our fearless Hannah Horanek, who will be speaking next. Um, so I'll start off and provide introductions uh, to the project. And Hannah will really deliver the meat of the talk, and then there will be will be joined uh, at the end by uh, Dr. Blair Schneider. Uh, and Hannah and Blair are both at the Kansas Geological Survey. Okay. So um, our work, uh, the Advanced Geo Partnership, is based on um, efforts of. Uh, of the whole partnership team, um, which has the goal of empowering scientists and geoscientists in particular to transform their workplace climates uh, through a focus on reducing hostile and exclusionary behaviors. So this work has been funded uh, since 2017 by the National Science Foundation Advanced Program. The first grant, uh, which I was not involved in, but a colleague at UC Merced, Asmaret Berhe, was uh, the PI for UC Merced, um, as well as, uh, as many other institutions, uh, focused on collecting data and developing bystander intervention trainings um, that are anchored uh, by scenarios that are really common experiences that many of us have, have, have experienced in our discipline. And um, we also we're focusing on incorporating an intersectional lens. The subsequent project, which started last year, um, builds on the success of these efforts and aims to really systematize uh, the interventions across workplaces by developing a, a certification program that um, you know, helps train trainers uh, and also um, you know, expanding from a bit of these individual-based trainings to fuller, a fuller workplace climate intervention program. So these projects are the result of work done uh, by a whole team of people and institutions. So I've listed the affiliations here of the primary PIs and grant leads. Um, and overall, our goals are to contribute uh, to our, our individual fields, whether it's earth sciences, vertebrate paleontology, biology, et cetera, um, in a variety of different ways. Um, we really want to focus on setting expectations for and rewarding ethical conduct through uh, education of ourselves and our colleagues, um, as well as helping uh, ourselves, our institutions, uh, develop and implement appropriate policies. Um, we also are aiming to provide leadership or provide opportunities for leadership uh, across hierarchies, um, going from, you know, folks who are sort of in the training stages to folks who are in the leadership, uh, in the traditional leadership stages. Um, and, you know, in doing so, really uh, focus on diversifying our discipline. And our partnerships with societies such as GSA uh, and HGU aims at building accountability for society members and leaders. Um, and in this current phase of the project, were really focused in particular on influencing culture within and across disciplines by leveraging partnerships with, um, with new organizations. And so a lot of these, uh, some of these partners are existing partners such as Earth Science Women's Network, Association of Women Geoscientists, GSA, AGU. Um, we also collaborate with AMS uh, and the uh, 
long-term uh, ecological research network. Um, and we have new partnerships, including um, the AAPI, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in geosciences with Black and geoscience, with uh, Latinas in earth and planetary science or geo-Latinas, geo with Society of Latinas, Hispanics in earth and space sciences or SOLAS, and with 500 women scientists. And I'm going to hand it off to Hannah now. Hannah, you are muted. Of course, I knew that that would happen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, it is really good to be here. I do consider myself a paleontologist. I do have a uh, quite a bit of background in paleontology, specifically museums work. So I was really excited to be asked to give this talk. So one of the things that we focus on with Advanced Geo is, as Jessica said, uh, promoting equity in field-based sciences. So um, we've worked to study the inequities in academia, which lead to the harder road that most identities must take uh, to make a successful STEM career for themselves. Um, the original pipeline on the left, as you can see in the photo, um, assumes there's one path forward for all identities in STEM, which is problematic for a few reasons, because it assumes that all people have the same background, uh, privileges, and they begin at the same starting point, which is just simply untrue. We all start from different starting points in STEM, and based on your identity and through our research, we found that, uh, if <laughs> it's uh, it's a little bit harder for most identities to make a career in STEM. So uh, what you're seeing on the right is um, kind of the path that a lot of excluded groups take to get to the same end point that other identities on the left experience. Um, we have found that oppression and hostilities have a deep history in US society, which is rooted in white supremacy. Um, so we, as part of our research, we interviewed focus groups and we found that common themes emerged. Uh, people experiencing harassment and discrimination in our field were likely to list these four crit criteria as markers for why they found it harder to find connection and belonging in their respective STEM fields. So these included uh, their role of identity and intersectionality. So how they identified or how the world sees them greatly impacts their ability to perform work in their discipline. Uh, additionally, alcohol use, especially during department socials, professional meetings, and in the field can have a big impact on how they're treated and whether they experience discriminatory, discriminatory behaviors or not. Um, lack of relevant harassment training. This is a big one. So mo most of the trainings that exist in or existed in the past either did not seem relevant or did not give participants specific skills that they could use to counteract or report harassment when it occurs in their departments. So nothing like STEM based or relevant to their field or their workplace. And finally, sexual harassment does not happen in a vacuum. There are multiple um, different facets to why this happens in our field. And participants described experiencing a number of incivilities or hostile behaviors related to their gender and other identities. So we've identified that this is a problem. So let's look kind of a little bit more into the data that we've collected and published in. So among our research, we found that harassment, bullying, and microaggressions actually encompass a wide variety of exclusionary behaviors. Um, and because these are such broad terms, I wanna take a few minutes to explore them in detail. So harassment can, can encompass a lot of different things, right? So um, being given hard tasks, being excluded from conversations, um, just a lot of different things. Uh, so that encompasses bullying as well. And then also microaggressions. Uh, these are big, commonplace incivilities that occur every day that most people with who are who identify with um, historically excluded identities experience every day. Um, we found that disabled geoscientists experienced more negative workplaces 
So this included devaluation of work and effort, efforts, insulting remarks, fears for physical safety and bullying. Uh, we also found that lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, pansexual, asexual respondents experienced greater interpersonal mistreatment. Um, we compared the overall percentage of incivility events by gender identity, and we found that um, non-binary respondents and women experienced higher rates of incivility than men. So this is consistent with the results of previous research that marginalized groups experience, and it has a disproportionate impact of civilities based on identity. We found that 23% of women and 33% of non-binary respondents experienced devaluation of their work and efforts uh, as compared to 10% of men, 18% of women and 30% of non-binary respondents experienced bullying compared to 7% of men, 20% of women and 33% of non-binary respondents experienced re insulting remarks compared to 7% of men. And obviously this should be 0%, right? So we're not trying to discount the harm that occurs to men, right? Like 10% of men, 7% of men, 7% of men. The, these are still numbers that should be at zero. So let's take steps to address this. Additionally, students, postdocs, and tra trainees were twice as likely to experience sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, so this comes down to um, power dynamics, right? So people who are late stage career typically hold more power in the workplace and have the have the wherewithal and the um, the means to uh, create a hostile workplace for people who don't have power and who don't have the um, faculties to stand up for themselves. Uh, so we found that 8.6% of all others experience gender harassment, but 15.9% of students, postdoctoral researchers or trainees experienced sexual harassment. 15%, that's incredible. Um, in addition, 4.6% of students experienced unwanted sexual attention and 3.2% experienced sexual co coercion in the workplace. And obviously this number should be zero. Women of color experience different rates of sexual harassment than white women. So looking through our um, intersectional lens, um, women, as a whole are experiencing these exclusionary behaviors, but in set of that, women of color are experiencing so much more than white women. So we found that women of color experienced 21.4% of sexual harassment and gender harassment in the workplace as compared to 19.9% of white women. So we found that gender harassment was the common denominator of all sexual harassment. Um, so this included unwanted sexual attention, sexual coercion, um, and just coercion in general. So 77.2%. So we found that 14% experienced sexual harassment. 17% of those were geoscientists of color. 20% of them were women. 26% of disabled respondents were um, disabled. 33% <laughs> were LGBTQPA+, and 51% were non-binary or gender non-conforming individuals. So we have this disproportionate impact, um, but overall, all geoscientists suffer. So 52% of non-binary geoscientists were more likely to consider leaving their discipline, uh, followed by women, which was 25%, and then men, which is 11%. Disabled geoscientists were more likely to skip a professional activity, 33% versus 20%, uh, consider a career change, and consider leaving their discipline. LGBTQPA plus respondents were more likely to consider a career change, 48%, or leaving their discipline, 30%. 29% of black, women, black men and 50% of black women surveyed reported 
considering leaving the geoscientists. So kind of the flip of the coin for Black women is whether they will stay in the geosciences, geosciences or whether they will leave. Jessica mentioned earlier that we look through the lens of intersectionality. And to briefly define that, that is the um, that is when an individual experiences the intersection of discrimination in multiple identities. So being Black, being a woman, that's the intersectionality of experiencing the discrimination between those two identities. Um, so according to new research by um, some of our colleagues, Diaz Vallejo, folks of color and others from excluded groups experience disproportionate feelings of lowered work productivity, thoughts of leaving their discipline, and concerns about physical safety at work. This causes problems in all aspects of our discipline, and it can have harmful impacts on individuals seeking a fulfilling career. Um, finally, Diaz Vallejo, uh, they're coming out with re research from a recent study that they did, and they found that um, among the people who report experiencing bullying, harassment, intimidation, and discrimination, there is a wide disparity between different groups and overall satisfaction of the outcome of their report. So if they do report this behavior, there are very wide, there's a very wide swing on the pendulum as to whether they're satisfied with uh, the retro, not really retribution, but what the outcome of their report and what their university did um, to the person who was targeting them. Um, most shocking to me is that 75% of white non-binary and gender non-conforming individuals, as well as 100% of non-binary and gender non-conforming people of color, report unsatisfactory results from reporting exclusionary behaviors. Um, is Blair a participant right now? Hello. Awesome. I'm going to hand it over to you. If you want to just keep your slides up too. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Hannah, for a wonderful job. Sorry, I was late. Um, so I wanted to come in and, and kind of wrap this up with some of our work and the, the frameworks that we're using to try and address some of the data that you just saw. Um, first off, let's summarize um, why discrimination, racism, and harassment continue to persist in science and academia. Um, the key takeaway here is that it's really by design. We have archaic, gendered, and racialized hierarchies in academia. We have stereotypes of geoscientists as heteronormative and ableist cisgender white men. Think about how academia was designed. Um, it's an exclusionary culture and exclusionary practices. Academia was designed for a specific group um, hundreds of years ago. And we also have tolerated a culture of impunity. Um, researchers who've brought in lots of money. Institutions have been absolutely loath to penalize them regardless of their bad behavior because they want to protect that money that's come in. Next slide. So some of the take home messages that really came from that climate survey is that workplace experiences in the geosciences, you know, everyone is experiencing exclusionary behaviors. I think that's an important thing to take away, but that the disproportionate impact differs by gender, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability status, and career stage. And systemic, systematically excluded groups experience more negative workplace environments and are more likely to report negative career outcomes. Um, and that these diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts need to address hostile behavior effects on careers and retention in the geosciences. This is really important. I think oftentimes we think about exclusionary behaviors, you know, just having that individual impact on a person, right? So we really want to bring home, uh, drive home this idea that there's lots of data out there that's actually showing you that the impacts um, of these behaviors isn't just psychological, which it is though, right? I mean, isolation, safety, trauma, um, increased anxiety. There's been measured physiological impacts of these experiences. This leads to professional uh, negative impacts. So increasing insecurity reduces productivity, recruitment, and retention. That then stems into economic impacts, right? Um, and I think we're seeing this now as this hits us from an economic perspective, 
we now start to have societal impacts with distrust in leadership, low morale, and a real weakening of the academic enterprise. And just to emphasize this again, this disproportionately impacts systematically excluded individuals and groups. So these hostile behaviors have ripple effects on the community with long lasting harm and tolerating these behaviors perpetuates harm. So Advanced Geo has come together um, to really try and figure out, okay, how can we address this from different levels? Um, our first grant was really focused on this individual level uh, with developing these workshops and gathering the data on what we're experiencing to begin with. Our second grant is trying to take this uh, up a step to look at that departmental or institutional level to build that um, positive workplace climate. But to do this, we're using two frameworks. The first framework that we're using is intersectionality. Um, and so this is a framework that was really um, coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a legal scholar. Um, and that one is really giving us that lens of, okay, let's look and see how, um, how these in, how these are disproportionately impacting different groups based on identity, right? We're at this um, intersection of uh, oppression here. But then the second framework that we're using is this ethics of care framework. Um, so next slide here. Ethics of care framework is an ethical theory um, with the power to change the way we evaluate personal relationships and professional conduct. And so it's really stressing that we as individuals are not independent free agents you know, in our workplaces, but we're members of a community. So as a geoscientist, I'm not just an individual geoscientist. I interact with all geoscientists in this community. And these relations and interdependence yield social responsibility to each other. And so it's really trying to bring this idea that it's a community effort to address these behaviors. And it's, um, also valuable because it's really recognizing imbalances of power and resources and how that affects how the community can respond um, to these types of behaviors. So next slide, enacting this in our profession would look like challenging individualism, right? Um, no, more ha no longer having that, that lone genius, but let's really emphasize our collaboration. I mean, look at Advanced G, we've got like 12 people um, on this project, which is overwhelming at times, but also, oh my gosh, it makes our work so much better um, and really helps us better inform our research and our, and our practices. We need to value people and relationships over data. Um, that's our slogan here is treat people better than data. We need to utilize bystander intervention as a community-based approach for accountability and support. We need to always make sure that we're making space for wellness, mental health, trauma, and healing. And something that really gets overlooked is making sure we are valuing labor of care, um, that emotional labor or that hidden labor, recognizing who's shouldering it. Um, how are we rewarding that? How are we supporting the individuals who are taking on more of that emotional labor? Um, those are ways in which we can start enacting this um, ethics of care framework into our profession. Next slide. However, I do want to point out, you know, one important consideration when considering ethics of care is the community that it came from. This framework has really emphasized barriers within the gender paradigm. However, in doing so, it hasn't um, really addressed other identities, for example, such as race. Black feminist scholarship teaches us how to expand from an ethics of care to a liberatory practice. Black feminist scholarship takes us beyond gender and can guide us in how to free ourselves from the oppressions of patriarchy and white supremacy, how to recognize our role in oppression, and by doing so, support the freeing of others. And so I think this is really important because what we can learn from this scholarship and what we're working on learning now is that there are other models that are also possible. Um, there's a quote on here that comes from, from Bell Hooks. So as a black woman, Bell Hooks remembers her experiences in the university. When I entered my first women's studies class, white women were reveling in this joy of being together. To them, it was an important momentous occasion. But I had not known a life where women had not been together, where women had not helped, protected, and loved one another deeply. Um, and she reminds us, because you know, she reflects that she hadn't known a life where women, and in particularly Black women, hadn't been together. They, they were always helping, protecting, and loving one another deeply. 
And so she reminds us that we can bring not only care, but also love to our work and not only for our work, but for each other. And so that everyone can pursue their dreams free from oppression. Next slide. And so when you leave us today, a question for you to reflect on um, is to kind of ask yourself, how do you care for your community? And look at that through different lenses within my lab group, within my departments, within my professional societies, within my family, my community as a whole, right? What are some ways that you are maybe enacting this ethics of care framework um, in your community? So in summary, um, we need to reckon with violent histories of exclusion of institutions of higher education and STEM disciplines. Um, this is something Advanced GU has been working on for several years now. We're continuing to do this work. Um, and I think I speak for the three of us when I say we really appreciate this opportunity to come and, and give this presentation here and interact with your group. Um, and um, Hannah, did you wanna note anything about uh, Ebony and Ivory, Ebony and Ivy there? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, always. Um... I don't want to say anything except that we need to listen to the voices of excluded individuals. We need to read their literature, listen to what they're telling us, and to include them in more of these discussions. Um, I know that today um, it's three white women coming and talking to you about how um, the experiences of Black women and excluded identities are being treated in STEM. Um, but... <laughs> We do need to be listening to these people and inviting them to the table. And hopefully in the future, we can have more people who feel included in STEM, who want to be included and feel like they have a sense of community here so that they're supported and ready to have fulfilling careers in STEM. So that starts by reading their literature, reading what they've said, um, listening to them, attending their talks and supporting your colleagues in your department. Um, I know a lot of people here uh, are faculty in departments and um, also just working in academia through museums or different paleontological work. We need to support our diverse and excluded uh, colleagues. We need to listen to them and um, give their voice meaning and weight.